and so I've been asked to talk about pulmonary function tests or PFTs. Um, I've talked with the group before, but this is the first time I've done virtual, so let's see how this goes. And uh, I know you guys are starting to get used to the virtual now. It's been, what, a year and a half, almost two years we've been having to do suffer through this. Um, but um, I hope that we can talk and answer a lot of questions as a kind of maybe towards the end, but please feel free to interrupt me along the way. Um, so since you guys all have lung issues, uh, I'm assuming uh, at least 95% of you guys have had breathing tests before. Um, and they're so hard to describe what they are um, to people when I try saying, I'm going to do these pulmonary function tests, these breathing tests um, to see how your breathing is doing. And it, it's nothing that hurts. It was hard to tell, explain to people that it's really hard to do, but I'm not going to hurt you. Um, but you guys all know, it's pretty hard to, to do these PFTs. Uh, they, they get, they're good cheerleaders, they get the best out of you, but it's, uh, it's a little torture for, for about half an hour. So what are we doing in the, when we do these? Hopefully it's gonna work. Um, there we go. So this is what the, the chamber looks like. You have to sit in the, in the box, as everybody calls it, uh, and we do breathing tests. The, at one point, the box is enclosed around you if you get the full set of breathing tests. And um, so they put a clamping in it. Well, before you even go these days, because you know, these are the days of COVID, you have to get uh, COVID tested. Even if you've been vaccinated, you still have to get COVID tested. And if you remember when you've done these breathing tests, you have to blow really, really hard in multiple times. So if you think about the person before you that was in there, you don't want them blowing all these germs around, all these COVID germs. So you've got COVID, you know, they had COVID and now you've got it because it's sitting in that room. So even though you've been vaccinated, everybody has to get tested for COVID. Um, then you come in and uh, depending what we're looking for, your breathing tests, uh, you may be in there for about a half an hour. You might be in there for about an hour um, using various pieces. And sometimes that door is opened and sometimes it's closed. And it also depends on what tests we're doing and how well you can tolerate it. Some people cannot tolerate that door being closed. They just feel claustrophobic with it. Uh, and then there's some people, let's say you're in a wheelchair and you can't, you, you don't have the mobility to get onto the bench in the, the box. We may not be able to do all the breathing tests that we would want to do, but we'll, they can do their best to get what we need. So this is one of our nurses uh, demonstrating here, one of them here in our PFT lab. And then the only one have to do is one at a time. Here she is doing one of the other tests. <clears throat> um, and so we can bring your oxygen in if needed. Uh, we, you can see the oxygen tank down there. So um, normally you're probably not going to see this little uh, tube back here. Really, you're seeing just this when you guys go. It's depending where you go, but because of COVID, we need to make this negative pressure room. So this is uh, making negative pressure here. So this isn't a big, scary thing back here. It's just blowing the air out. So... First part we do, we're going to look over these breathing tests. We're going to talk about what we see and what we're looking for when we do breathing tests. So um, the first part, you might see this. You get a little visual, maybe the birthday cake, lots of candles. You might have to knock down um, the bricks um, when you huff and puff like the big bad wolf. Uh, you might have to blow up a balloon. It all depends on the visualization. is just to try to get you to try to blow. Because these tests, again, are really, really hard to do. Um, when your breathing is normal, let alone when you're short of breath. So what we're looking at, this is called the flow volume loop. So this is part of what we look at. So this is how you're breathing. So this is, when, think about when you're taking a deep breath in or any kind of breath, when you're taking a press, uh, breath in, it's, you're creating a negative pressure in your chest to take a breath in. And then it's a positive pressure when you blow out. So we're going negative here when we take a breath in. So you take a breath in. So they take a, you know, they're telling you take a deep breath. You take that deep breath. Let me close my door here for a second. So this is you taking a deep breath here. So we're looking at this. We're looking at this flow volume loop down here to make sure you take that, that nice deep breath. But if you can't, it may be a little abnormal here, and that'll help us kind of figure out what's going on. And then you have to blow out as hard as you can and then as long as you can. And we're going to look at what all that means in a minute. But you take this breath in so you can fill up your chest. And then you have to 
blow, and then they say blow, 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 blow for another six seconds. Everybody's remember, you guys all remember that, right? You've all had to do that before. So this first peak here is that first second when they, they have you blow, and then you blow, 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 that those six seconds come down here. And what we're looking for again is if this is flattened here, maybe something's blocking you from being able to take that breath in. And then for most lung diseases, most of them are more getting the breath out. So we're looking at this. So maybe you can't hit this all the way up here and have this nice little um, thing down here. And so quite often we can kind of see little dots along the way where the normal is. Um, we don't have it here, but it'll tell us how much less that you can do compared to normal. And then if you remember having these tests done before, you have to do them multiple times. You have to do them at least three because they get a, um, they average three of them together, but sometimes it's hard to get those three. So you might be doing it five or six times. And so each of these lines in here is each of the attempts of doing it. So again, negative uh, inspiration is a negative pressure. <gasps> and then the expiration is blow when you blow out and you blow, 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 blow for those six, six seconds. And then here we are looking at it again. Uh, and these are actually giving some of the test results up here when you're starting to do it. But we're gonna look at the test results in a different way. So we're gonna, we're kind of ignoring the top of the screen there. So again, here's the person taking a deep breath in and they kind of probably went, ah, ah, kind of like that, took a little hiccup here and then blow and they had to blow out as hard as they could and then blah, 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 blah. And then when we look at it again, here's that person blowing out and then blowing for those six seconds. So we can see they kind of actually were able to make it more like about eight seconds on their blowing out there. So this is what we're looking at. So when we do breathing tests and we look to see, we have um, the actual here, what the predicted was, what percentage of this is, and then for all the examples I have, I just have this pre and, and I'll talk about the post in a minute. So what we're looking at is based on your height and weight, your age, your sex, and your race. And the computer says what your normal, what we predict that you should be able to do. So if you're a 55 year old black male, uh, that you're 6'2 and 350 pounds, we're going to, it's going to predict what you should be able to blow versus a 20 year old uh, white female who is 411 and weighs 90 pounds. They're going to be having two different predicted numbers. You know, the, the kind of the trick in there is as we're kind of going where we are in the world right now is if you're transgender, we got to base this on where you, on your assigned, um, gender at birth because a because you have to get the male and female cut in there. So it, it makes a difference in your predicted numbers. So um, pre mean right here, the pre -bron uh, bronchodilator. Um, so if we're looking for things like asthma and COPD and those kinds of things, quite often we you do the breathing test and then you get um, some albuterol, whether it's through the inhaler, like in a spacer maybe, or you get a nebulizer treatment. Um, used to be, at least here at VC, we always did the nebulizer treatment until COVID. So now you get it, the albuterol inhaler. And then we'll repeat the test again. And it only counts that this first part, these spirometries, is what we're looking with the pre and the post. So kind of breaking this down, what we're looking at, uh, or what this all kind of comes down to, is what's going on here, um, kind of in these air sacs here. So um, what we're looking at um, is here is someone with obstructive lung disease, or actually over on this side. So this is a nice normal airway here. Um, and especially when you compare it here, you can see how much thickened it is, it's inflamed, there's mucus in there. So this is someone with some kind of obstructive lung disease, whether this is asthma exacerbation, asthma flare, COPD is acting up, they have bronchiectasis, they have cystic fibrosis, they've got something going on in the airways compared to the normal airway. So that's what we're looking at in a minute. And then we're also looking at, this is scarring. So this is someone with pulmonary fibrosis and this little green, this little step here is supposed to represent scarring of that airway. But it's the scarring of the lungs, um, not the inside diameter of these airways, 
like here in the obstructive lung disease, this is scarring of the tissue itself, not the airway. So when we look, and these are a little blurry, and I'm going to do a second set in a few minutes. We'll go through another set of PFTs that aren't so blurry when I tried to blow them up to see them. So this is called the spirometry, and this is the most common kind. If you happen to be in, the, in someone's office, you're not in the big booth in the formal PFT lab. If you do it in the office, they, do, they can only do spirometry there. And with the spirometry, what we're looking at is we are looking at the FVC, so the forced vital capacity. And this tells us how much you can blow in those six seconds. So when it's blow, 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 that's what we're looking at. So how much, how much can your air, your lungs move like this? So going back to here, to the fibrosis, the scoring of the lungs is one of the things we're looking at. So something is keeping the lungs from being able to do this. So it might be the scoring. It could be if um, you really have really bad scoliosis or kyphosis where you're leaning over like this so that you can't expand your lung out or your chest out. Or someone's morbidly obese. They just have all that weight on their chest. They can't be moving their, their lungs in and out. So that's what the FBC is showing. We're looking for what's called restriction. So what's restricting the lungs from moving? And this person um, blew 1.52 liters. They were predicted based on height, weight, sex, um, age, that kind of thing to blow 2.56 liters. So they're at 53% of predicted. So they're low. So they're not 100% predicted. So sometimes when giving your lung, your lung function number, you say, you know, what percentage of my lungs working? These are quite often the numbers we're talking about here. So this person's 53%. <clears throat> then we look at what's called the FEV1. So the forced expiratory volume in one second. So this is where they say, take a deep breath and blow. This is that first second out that I showed you that peak that went up. That's what this is looking at. So this is looking at, whoops, looking at this. How much air, air can go through those airways? Is there something blocking the airways? So this one is blocked by inflammation, a lot of junk in there. So it's hard to get air through those airways. If you have this nice big airway, air is blown back and forth. And then also when we're looking at this restriction, air is blown back and forth through there. They can move through the tubes, we can move through the pipes, but um, what we're looking at for the FBV1 is something blocking it. Again, mucus, inflammation, um, they're narrowed for some other reason. It could be um, you have a foreign body stuck in there. That will give you an obstructive disease or obstructive pattern. So we look at the FEV1 and this one, this person's 56% of predicted. So when we're saying their numbers, they're about 56, 56% 56 of their lung functions, what they have. And we typically look at this other number here, this FEV1 FBC ratio, and that kind of tells us, helps us sort out whether this is due to restrictive lung disease or this is due to the airways. So it helps kind of define it a little bit better. So this gives us a picture of things. Now, if this number here, this ratio number was less than 70%, this is where you get an albuterol breathing treatment and you get it repeated again. So you get the albuterol in about 15 to 30 minutes, they repeat the test again and we're looking to see if there's improvement or reversibility is what we call it. And if there's reversibility, this makes us think of things like asthma. If there's not reversibility, we can think of things more like COPD, or emphysema, chronic bronchitis, those kinds of things. And so it makes a difference in how we're going to treat you, whether you have more asthma or you have more of a COPD kind of picture going on. And then if your, your airways are normal, but you're completely as short as a breath. So if your FEV1 is normal, but your FVC is really low, then we know there's something more restrictive going on. We've got to figure out what that is. Is that, again, pulmonary fibrosis? Is this sarcoidosis? Is this just um, your body is very twisted because of uh, a bony deformity of your rib cage? So that's looking at spirometry. So then um, we want to look at lung volume. So how big are your lungs? So how much can you take in? So this is someone taking their normal breaths, and then they take a nice deep breath, and they blow it out, normal breaths again. So we're looking at when you blow out, how much, number one, how big are your lungs? This total lung capacity here, going from top to bottom. When you take a deep breath in, deep breath out, how, how big do your lungs get? 
And then residual volume here, once you blow everything out, how much air is left? So if you think about a balloon, once you blow up a balloon the very first time, you can never get all that air back out of the balloon again, right? So people with COPD, those lungs get, get or even asthma, the air gets stuck in there, air trapping. So you take a breath in, but not all the air comes back out. So the residual volume, how much is left when you blow out everything you can? So here's someone obstructive lung disease. This happens to be COPD. This is a normal healthy lung over here. And then we look at this lung over here. You can see how much bigger this left lung is over here. Um, and when we look at lungs, it's like we're looking at you when we look at all these things. So this over here is the right-hand side and this over here is the left-hand side because we're looking, we're looking at their face. So you can see how big the lungs are here. Just air gets stuck in there. These airways are all broken and they can't get the air out. And then this is a restrictive lung disorder. So this could be interstitial lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis. Um, again, some kind of abnormal scarring from you had TB, you got a lot of scarring in your lungs years ago, or uh, you had part of your lung taken out or something. Something's causing this lung. If you can see this is the right lung, this is the left lung how much smaller this left lung is. So this is restrictive, the lung is small. So here looking at these lung volumes, we're gonna look at the residual volume, the RV residual volume. So once you blow everything out, how much air is left? And this one, we really just look over here at this number, this percentage number again is 89%, which is normal. So this person, once they blow everything out, they can get out as much as a normal person can get out. They don't have a lot of air left in their lungs at the end. When we look at the TLC or the total lung capacity, and this is 75%, so this is a little bit low, 75% of what is normal. So this person has this smaller lung or lungs. So um, because there's a scar there or something's restricting it. So mostly a scar or whatever that they can't, again, get the lungs to move quite as well. So the lungs are smaller. Um, and so when your lungs can't do what they're supposed to, it makes you feel short of breath when they're smaller. When you have a lot of air stuck in there because you have COPD and you blow everything out and you can't get air still trapped in there, it makes you feel short of breath because you just can't get all that out. The third main part we look at when we do these breathing tests is we're looking at gas exchange. So looking at how can oxygen and carbon dioxide go across those membranes and, and exchange through your heart and lungs. Because remember, blood comes, old blood comes from the right side of your heart into your lungs. And the whole point of it coming into your lungs is to pick up oxygen, go back to the left side of the heart and get pushed out into the brain and the toes and everywhere you need oxygen. So how can you pick up that oxygen? So hang on one sec. So here's a nice normal. Um, here's your air sac, those great, all those little grapes we always talk about. Um, so your airways get smaller, smaller, smaller. So they end up in the grape sac, the alveoli. And then around that, all these blood vessels go around these, uh, the, these alveoli. So this is a blow up of an alveoli here. And um, this is blood flow going by unoxygenated blood that goes and picks up the blood, the oxygen, and then it comes out. So going from this little membrane here, to this little capillary here, carbon dioxide is going in and oxygen is coming out. So you have to have a nice circuit to make that happen. But what if you have scarring or something like pulmonary fibrosis? This wall now is very thickened. The blood vessels are still coming by, but those air, that wall is thickened, so it's harder for oxygen to get across a carbon, and carbon dioxide to get across that thickened membrane. What if you have something like emphysema? Here's a normal grape sac, the normal alveoli. Here's someone with emphysema. You can see how much destruction there is. So those airways are getting destroyed, so there's not as much airways there or not as much capillaries and stuff for everything to kind of get by and for them to be able to get the blood and uh, the oxygen and the carbon dioxide by right so the airways are getting destroyed 
And this one, so it's pneumonia. So all this yellow pussy stuff is stuck in those airways. So it's hard for oxygen carbon dioxide to get back and forth through all that muck in there. So we think about a lot of things when we think about this. In addition, we think of things like, so again, is we have to have this capillary has to be nice and thin and good. And the air, oh, let me go back to this one. Nice and thin and this, this airway here has to be nice and thin. So if we have, if you have heart failure, your blood gets actually diluted. So it can be, um, it can make a change. If you're anemic, so your blood counts are really low, you need hemoglobin to come by and pick up the oxygen to keep it going. So if you're anemic, if you're anemic and you don't have enough hemoglobin going by to pick up the oxygen, that can make things abnormal with picking up the carbon dioxide and the oxygen. So we look at this, this is, and again, we're gonna be able to see this one, do the next set of uh, pictures, it'll be a little clearer in the wording. So we look at the DLCO or the diffusion capacity. And we look at it two ways. This is the uncorrected, so it says DLCO, UNC, uncorrected. And then we have corrected, which didn't happen. We didn't know what their hemoglobin was. So this person is 19% of predicted. Very, very, very low. So something's going on in those airways at the level of right here where carbon dioxide and oxygen are not be able to do their thing. So this person's wearing oxygen. They need to because something's abnormal there. So then what we have to figure out is what's going on to make that happen. So we're looking at all that whole picture of all those three parts, and that tells us really how things are going in your lungs. So this person, I'm going to move back up to her original one here. <clears throat> Whoops, here she is. So when I put her picture together, her FVC is really low, so she's having problems doing this. Her TLC is small. She's got small lungs, so she's got some scarring because um, we know she's female up here. It did seem female, so we know it's a she. And her DLCO is really low. So she, this person actually has a lot of scarring of her lungs. She actually has pulmonary fibrosis. And so the scarring is keeping her lungs from doing this. Um, they're smaller than they should be. And she's having a hard time with the gas exchange, getting oxygen, carbon dioxide to go across those membranes. So I'm gonna move on to another um, person's breathing test. So this one, um, again, we've got the three parts and we're gonna look at each of these three parts individually again. So here's the first part. Oh, actually, I'm not gonna see the end, so we have to go. So this person, their FVC, force vital capacity. So what's happening here with things moving. So those six seconds that you have to blow out they um, blew 2.29 liters and they were predicted, their reference or their predicted was 2.4 liters, 4.0 liters or 95% of predicted. So a lot different than the other person had only 56% of predicted or 53. And then this person actually got a breathing treatment and um, they did not improve, they actually went down. They went from 2.29 liters to 2.14 liters. So they did not respond to albuterol. And then we look over here at the FEV1 or the first of the forced expiratory volume in one second set. Whoa, so well, this is looking at the airways, what's going on in the airways. So they blew 1.83 liters. Um, I'm sorry, they blew 0.66 liters. They were predicted to do 1.83 liters. So they were only at 36% of predicted, so pretty low. And they went from 0.66 liters to 0.68 liters, which is a 4% change after some albuterol. So they did not respond to the albuterol. To say that you've responded, um, one of these two numbers has to improve by, sorry, one of these two numbers has to improve by at least 12 um, plus 12 um, in the percent change. And um, these two numbers have to increase by 200 milliliters. So biggest thing to think about is this has to increase by 12%. And this was negative seven and positive 4%. So this person did not improve. Um, so based on this, these numbers right here, we're looking at someone who has obstructive lung disease. So the, something in the airways that's causing 
changes and they, they get short of breath because of something in the airways, not because they can't move their lungs back and forth with scarring. So then when we look at the lung volumes, so again, we're looking at how big the lungs are and how much air is left at the end. And we look at the total lung capacity and it's 126% of predicted, our other person was only 70 something percent of predicted. So this person has fairly long, big lungs. And then a residual volume, once they blow everything out, how much is left is 161% of predicted. So this person's holding on to air when they blow everything out, air is left behind and their lungs are bigger than they should be. And then when we look at the diffusion capacity, this DLCO, again, looking at gas exchange, they're 69% of predicted and they got adjusted. So I looked at their hemoglobin and it was normal. So it never changed. So 69% predicted is a little low. And again, that's going back to, I'm gonna show this picture again. We're going back to this stuff here where there's not enough um, of the airways here for the blood vessels to go by and exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen. 69% is not very low, but it is a little low. So there is some going on there. So this person, when we look back at their big um, thing here, this person has COPD. So we've got a totally different picture here compared to the person with the pulmonary fibrosis. Um, so these two are pretty, at least for me, pretty black and white, but sometimes they're really confusing. So sometimes um, I hate the ones that come in and the, the, they do their breathe, I do breathing tests on it. They're huge smokers and I do their breathing tests and they're totally normal. I'm always waiting for something so I can say, please quit smoking because your, your breathing tests aren't normal. But I'm like, oh, well, your breathing tests are really normal. We still need to quit smoking. Um, so sometimes they, they're not so clear on what's going on. Um, and then sometimes, you know, diseases can be mixed. Um, people's bodies don't always read the books. It's not always black and white that you just have this particular thing and not this. You have asthma, but not COPD. Sometimes they get crossed. Some people have some fibrosis plus some COPD. They can get mixed up in all that too. Um, but, and there can be other things that can cause each of the problems. So we always have to look at the bigger picture with the breathing test. So just looking at numbers don't always give us the answer. But that's kind of what I have in a nutshell, but I'm hoping to get a lot of questions from you guys. Or I've totally lost everybody. Most of us were muted, I think. I have a question. Mm-hmm. I go to pulmonary fibrosis. I have pulmonary fibrosis. I go to um, pulmonary associates. Mm -hmm. I have never ever had them to do a treatment while I was, and I've had this PFT test for years. Right. What's so, up with that? Right. So we really do. We're looking to see if you respond to albuterol if you have obstructive lung disease. So COPD, asthma, those kinds of things. So mostly if this FEV one number is low that's when we do the breathing test. When we get this 70 something below, usually it's definitely at 70 right here, but um, we got a, a percentage here of 37. So it counts, we, let's do some breathe, let's do an albuterol treatment and see how much it changes. So with pulmonary fibrosis, we shouldn't see that because pulmonary fibrosis, fibrosis again is the scoring of your lungs and your lungs are stiff and can't really move. So albuterol is not gonna help. So we don't do that, but so yeah. correct. You should not be getting some albuterol with your breathing yeah. test. I have a question. I have a question because I have asthma. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I don't know what all I have. You know, you talk to different people, they tell you I got different things. Um, I have bron bronchiectasis. I have asthma. Somebody, one doctor said I have COPD, so I, I don't know if I have all three. But when I took the um, breathing test and they gave me a butyrol, the lady said she'd never seen anybody. Um, respond so well to that abutyrol that I did. It did such a big jump that she was uh -huh. like stunned. Um, so, and she said, it's a good thing you have asthma because asthma is like correctable, whereas as, uh, some other things are not. So can you explain that? Yeah, um, so some people, uh, so you got the albuterol, you know, so you did it, you, your uh -huh. FEV1 would have been low. 
and then they give you albuterol. And remember, I said you had changed by at least 12%. So it sounds like you changed by a lot more than that. I've seen people change by like 37%. So they really can be some big changes. Um, and which means the airways are responding well. They relax and open up when you get that breathing treatment. Um, and so it tells us you have some kind of obstructive lung disease initially. So COPD, bronchiectasis, and asthma, all obstructive lung diseases. And then we had to kind of pick them apart and see which is which. And sometimes you can have a combination of all of it. Because she responded well to the albuterol, it makes it think, me think that asthma is number one. That's, that's the main thing going on because you responded so well to the albuterol. But you can have a combination of all of that. Um, and then asthma can kind of turn into COPD after years and years of having asthma sometimes. And COPD can start getting kind of an asthma kind of part, component to it over time. Um, people can still have asthma attacks to put them in the hospital. People can still die of an asthma attack. So I can't say having asthma is good um, mm. because you can still have problems and you still need to have it treated. Um, COPD is a slow progressive disease. And bronchiectasis, uh, it just depends on the extent of bronchiectasis and how well you keep your airways clear. Because a lot of people with bronchiectasis do just fine if they have just a small section of bronchiectasis in their lungs. And bronchiectasis is airways have been damaged. They've been stretched out. So it's like a rubber band that can't snap back anymore. The, elast the elasticity is gone. And it's, it's not everywhere. It's just in certain areas. So some people can have very mild and it's just a couple airways and some people have much more extensive. See, I learned something. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because nobody could tell me about bronchiectasis. It was like the mystery disease of the day. So huh. you just told me something. <laughs> Thank you. The number one thing for that is you need to keep your airways clear. So you don't build up mucus in there. Because it starts becoming like when you look at a pond on a summer day where it's just flat and it's green, all that scum is on that, that's what can happen in your lungs because all that scum can grow in there and bacteria grow in there and you get infected. Janet, you have done an amazing job of simplifying things. You've done a fantastic job of communicating it very simplistic that makes common sense. Until you get home tonight and you'll be like, Wait a minute, which one was that? <laughs> oh, wait, a you guys are at home. <laughs> mm -hmm. What other questions do you guys have? Anybody else? Huh? Y'all keep talking. I've got to go get a computer cord. My computer's getting ready to die. No, that was really good because, you know, sometimes you get the results and they'll say, oh, your breathing capacity is at you know, so-and-so percent, and you have no idea what does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, like if it says 60, is that out of 100? I mean, mm -hmm. nobody mm -hmm. really explains it mm -hmm. into detail, you know, so mm -hmm. that was very, very, mm -hmm. very good. Good. So when we do the spirometry, um, and this is where we're looking at the 95% and the 36%, that's really what the main numbers were telling people when they say, what's my lung function? When we're looking down here at these lung vines, that's telling about how big your lungs are or how small your lungs are, how much air do you get left in there? That that's just a totally different topic of when we're saying what your lung, what your numbers are kind of are. And then when we look at the diffusion capacity, we kind of look at that totally separate too. So usually the main thing we're talking about are these these numbers right up here. Wow, this was great. Have all of you had breathing tests where you've actually been in the booth or you've just had them in the office? Both. 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 Yeah. I've only had it in the booth. Mm -hmm. I, do, I do fine with it. They always say, oh, you're good. You're doing good. So, <laughs> But they're hard to explain to people. You know, when I try to tell people, you get on these breathing tests and they're going to be uncomfortable, but it's not going to hurt. It's really hard to explain. It's uncomfortable because you know you're trying to take a breath and they have it all uh, blocked off, and then Locked all of a sudden, off. boom, you can you can yeah. breathe. So it's really hard to hold your breath. All those times it'll blow really hard when they're yelling at you. So it's hard to do, but it doesn't hurt. Yeah, I find them extremely tiring. I'm exhausted when I'm finished. Can I go home for a nap? Yeah. How often should these tests be done? 
Because a lot of times you go and they'll say, uh, you know, a follow-up test, no test, you know, like no yeah. function yeah. test. So how often um, should she be done? Yeah, I think that depends. Um, it depends what you're doing. Um, usually, um, if you have fibrosis, and it's, I usually do them like once a year to see how things are doing. Um, if all of a sudden things are not looking so good, then I'll do them more often. Um, if it's something like sarcoid and the sarcoid has been quiet for years, it hasn't done anything, then I'll go every other year and then I'll probably start spreading them out. Um, if you have asthma, I tend not to do them as much as some other people. Other people quite often do them every time, especially if you do the little spirometry in the, in the office, which I can't do in my office. Um, because going through this every three months, cause I changed your inhaler. That's kind of a lot to put you through and expensive to put yeah. you through that. So, um, I tend not to do it as much kind of, I kind of go more with symptoms, COPD, maybe a little bit more often. If you're going to go to pulmonary rehab, you have to have the spirometry at least done um, within the last 12 months. Um, and so I'm, as I'm watching things kind of progress now, I have a couple of people, I haven't done their breathing tests since like 2010 or 2011. They have COPD and they were horrible looking in 2010 back then. And um, they were very, very functional. And so I haven't ever really repeated them because they're doing fine. So what am I going to do with that information? It says your breathing tests are really bad. Besides have them come back in so I can say your breathing tests are doing really bad. Um, sometimes, sometimes I'll repeat them faster. Like if you're a smoker and then you stop smoking, and you actually quit. I would do them again to say, let's see if they look better now that you've quit smoking. So how much do these tests cost? You said they're very expensive. How much do they usually run about? I'd say I have no idea, but I would think at least a thousand dollars the way you know healthcare goes. If mm -hmm. they do the spirometry in the office, it's a lot cheaper because it's the tech, you know, it's the office personnel doing it with the small piece of equipment, the laptop, versus having to have an appointment in the PFT lab with all the big equipment and they have to bring mm -hmm. in um, all the oxygen, oxygen, all the, all the all the different um, gases and stuff. But I don't know what the price is. And I haven't had anything denied. Have you ever had an adverse, anybody have an adverse reaction to doing the test? Um, come in and have some, you know, yeah. something affecting? Um, every so often. So when I'm at my study point office, the PFT lab is right there. Um, when I'm downtown, PFT lab's building over. So I don't know. But um, I've been, at any point, they've called me over a few times. Someone's been really short of breath with doing it. And we'll give them an albuterol treatment and watch them and they'll feel better. If you've never been coached by Janet, uh, go to MCV and get, get your test. <laughs> she gets the most out of you. Well, I don't perform the PFTs. I just order them. But if I, the person you want coaching probably is Robert. If you ever have Robert do your PFTs here at PCU, he gets he definitely gets the best out of you. Yeah. Well, you did them at one time, I didn't. No. 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 Hmm. No. Are you thinking of maybe Becky? I've been. She retired a few years ago. Uh-huh. Recording stopped. So any other questions? Question? What would you say to the statement if you were talking to them about their condition and anything that they should be doing or not doing? For which one? That um, the last one that you have up on the screen now, would you have any oh. suggestions for the patient? Uh, it does. Uh, I think I think they have COPD. I would like to see this number, this residual volume number, to go down a little bit. Um, so I would um, try medicate, you know, see what medications they were on, and see if there's anything different that we have to change um, medication-wise to try to. Because quite often when I see numbers like that, people feel like. Um, they feel that they just feel full or they feel like they can't really get all the air out. So by fixing this residual volume a little bit, if possible, uh, it might make them feel a little less short of breath. Okay. 
but I definitely, this person, I would definitely have on, on inhalers and on treatment. Janet, um, the the PFC test is a is a moment in time. That's yep. Yeah, you know, at the specific time. Uh, do you have any suggestions for um, or do you, can you tell me why sometimes they're better than other times in the same person, or, or is there a way you can prepare yourself to get the best possible results? Right. So it depends. So one of the hints I have, so if I'm trying to see what you have, this is beginning initial treatment kinds of things and making decisions. And someone has come, if you've come to me and you said, my primary care put me on these two inhalers because I was short of breath and we're not sure what I have, but here I am. And you're sitting in front of me. I'm going to have you stop your inhalers before you do the, the testing to see what you have. But once you're, on treatment, you stay on the treatment to have your testing. Um, I don't, I would not use the albuterol if you can the day of, because if you've just used your albuterol because you're feeling short of breath, and then we go to do a breathing, uh, go to do the testing, it may be better than it should have been because you've already taken some albuterol and opened up your airways. So that'd be the one thing I wouldn't do that day. If you have a cold, it will throw off your numbers. If you're feeling extra tired, it's gonna throw off your numbers. Um, I have one lady, we'll see, she just did some breathing tests and they weren't looking as good. And so we're gonna repeat them in six months, but just because of just what's been going on, she has been exercising like she was. So I think that may be part of it, that she's just getting a little deconditioned. So hopefully over the next six months as she gets back into pulmonary rehab and starts exercising again, we're gonna see those numbers go back to where she was. So there's many different things that can affect it. And so if I see something that's just not making sense, uh, I'll repeat them in three to six months rather than waiting a year to repeat it. Can I ask you, what, what do they do in pulmonary rehab? What is the... Um... Pulmonary rehab? Yeah. It's all, it's about exercising and it's about education. So on the exercising portion, if you go to a pulmonary rehab program, you have to... Um, ride an exercise bike you walk on the treadmill and you do some kind of arm exercises to build up your chest muscles and your arms because all this stuff is helping us helping you breathe uh, along the way they're watching you closely they're watching your heart rate your blood pressure your oxygen level they will say you know you can go a little faster or wait a minute let's pull you back a little bit um, and they do, they teach you how to breathe when you're exercising so that you can conserve oxygen as best you can and conserve your breath. They do lots of other teaching on nutrition and how to make sure you use your inhalers correctly, making sure you wear your oxygen if you need to. Um, so they're watching all that stuff. So it's an all encompassing, really good program um, that you go twice a week. They're a little hard to get into right now just because of COVID has. You know, everybody's being so careful with COVID and fewer people can be in the room at one time and that kind of thing. So it's a little harder. 